Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing cocaine. Okay, so we've now discussed uh, what is understood about uh, how cocaine actually achieves its psychomotor stimulant effect. What I want to do in this video is now explain uh, why or at least why we think it causes a come down, and then what I want to do is discuss why we think it causes addiction, or at least what we know about why it causes addiction. Okay, so firstly then, let's talk about the come down effect. So remember, the come down occurs um, after taking cocaine. Okay, so you initially get the high, and then a few hours afterwards, what you'll get is the exact opposite occurring. So you'll get a dysphoric mood, a bad mood. Okay, and uh, you'll have a, t a, a sort of you'll feel very tired. Okay, so it causes the exact opposite of what the cocaine initially caused. Okay, so how can I explain this? Well, we think that what happens is the brain becomes desensitized to the elevated levels of dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline that are caused by the cocaine. Okay, so let me give you an analogy to this. At the moment, you are listening to me uh, at a level uh, or at a volume level that you are comfortable with. Okay? But if I was to suddenly start shouting on this video, okay, so if I was to really belt at the camera, um, for a while what would happen is at your end you would hear me shouting, but very quickly what you would do is you just turn down the volume on the YouTube play uh, function uh, settings. Okay, uh, so you just turn down the volume so that I'd be back at a comfortable volume. Okay, um, now uh, that is effectively you desensitizing uh, yourself to uh, me. Okay, so you are turning down how much effect I am actually having at your end. Then, what if I actually went back to uh, talking at a more normal uh, loudness? If I stopped shouting and talked at a more normal level, uh, then at your end now, with your lower volume, I would actually go quiet for a while. Okay, so you'd hear me very quietly, uh, even though I'm talking at the normal level because you've now desensitized to my voice. Uh, you have, uh, you will hear me uh, lower than you should. But very quickly then, what you'll do is just readjust the volume back up, and then everything will be normal again. This is analogous to what happens uh, with cocaine. You initially take cocaine, dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline go up, up, up. Okay, that is analogous to me initially shouting. There are very high levels of dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline now. So what happens is the different portions of the brain desensitize to it, just like you would turn down the volume. Okay, so they reduce how responsive they are. They reduce the activity of the receptors for these neurotransmitters on their surface. Okay, so they desensitize to these monoamine neurotransmitters so that even though the levels of the monoamines are very, very high, uh, the actual activation that those monoamines are having on the different areas of the brain will go back to a more normal level because they're desensitizing to it. They are responding less to a certain amount of those monoamines. Okay, and then what will happen is as the cocaine's effect wears off, so as cocaine's moved, removed from the bloodstream, uh, what will then happen is the dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline will go back down as the dopamine transporter, the serotonin reuptake transporter, and the norepinephrine transporter become active again and remove it from the extracellular space. Now it will be uh, analogous to when I went down to the normal volume again and you uh, had got me on a lower volume and then you heard me too lowly. Okay, so you t heard me as a too low volume. Okay, now the brain uh, will uh, be responding too lowly even though the dopamine, serotonin and noradrenaline levels are back at the normal level, the actual amount of effect that those will be having on the areas of the brain will be lower than it should be because the areas of the brain have desensitized to the dopamine, serotonin and noradrenaline. But of course what will then quickly happen is the brain will resensitize and everything will go back to normal. But that's why you get this sort of um, swing to the opposite direction, okay, uh, because whilst the dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline levels have gone back down to what they should be, and the brain is still desensitized to them, 
then the amount of effect they'll actually be having on those areas of the brain will be lower than is normal. So you would expect it to swing in the exact opposite direction to what happens when you initially take the cocaine. And indeed, that's what we do observe as happening. You get this come down where you feel in a very bad mood uh, and you feel very tired. So we think that the explanation for what happens in the come down is that the brain has desensitized to the dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline, and as the cocaine is removed from your system, uh, of course, those the levels of those will go down, and then uh, the amount of uh, activity that they'll actually provoke in the different areas of the brain uh, will be lower than is normal, and that's why you swing in the opposite direction. Okay, so we think that desensitization of areas of the brain to these monoamine neurotransmitters is what underlies the come down uh, after taking cocaine. But as I say, it will renormalize, the brain areas will resensitize, and uh, no harm will be permanently done. Okay, so that's the come down now accounted for. Let's now take on the topic of addiction. Okay, what do we understand about why cocaine actually causes addiction? Okay, now for this, uh, we need to have a look at another structure in the brain, okay, because addiction is believed to be caused, um, or at least the central portion of the brain that we think is really important in addiction is an area called the nucleus accumbens, and I firstly want to show you where this thing actually is. Okay, so the nucleus accumbens is part of a structure called the striatum. So I'll firstly show you the striatum. Now you have two striatums. You have a left striatum and a right striatum, and they sit uh, deep within the brain. So that's one of the difficulties in understanding this portion of the brain, that it's not easily visible. It is buried deep inside the cerebral hemispheres, deep inside the cerebrum. So you'd have to penetrate this structure here. You'd have to dig down deeper and eventually you'd find it. Okay, so I'm going to draw at the structure in here. Okay, and this one will be the left one, okay, because we're looking from the left hand side, but you'll have a mirror image of one of these in the right cerebral hemisphere as well. Okay, so it'll be kind of like this. Okay, so the striatum has this incredible shape, like so. Okay, and it loops sort of around with the temporal lobe of the brain. Oops, I've forgotten that this is supposed to be for anyone. Uh, this is uh, the temporal lobe of the brain, this portion here, this sort of uh, portion uh, that's separate from uh, the rest of the cerebral hemisphere by this uh, crease here. Okay, so it loops around like that. Okay, and this structure uh, is what's called the striatum. Okay, so as I say, this one is the left striatum, and you will have the exact opposite on the uh, other side. Okay, so take, uh, put a mirror down the middle. So imagine sticking in a mirror in the plane of the piece of paper going down the middle. You'll have the mirror image of this on the other side. So you have two striatums. This is the left one. Okay, now the striatum can be divided up into three main portions. Okay, it can be divided up into more than three portions, but there are three main portions. Okay, and these are the divisions here, and I'll colour the different portions in. So we'll have this one here in vivid purple there. Okay, we'll have, in fact, actually I'll name them whilst I'm colouring them in. So this one in vivid purple is not one that we're interested in. This is called the putamen. Okay, that's just there. Um, for a little bit of added fact. Okay, so that one's called the Putman, and I'll colour the other one in that we're not interested in before we go to the final one that we are interested in. So this one here in turquoise, the one that loops around in this incredible way, okay, this is called the chordate nucleus, or just the chordate. Okay, so that's called the chordate here. And then that final bit is the bit that we're actually interested in here. That is the nucleus accumbens, buried deep inside the cerebral hemisphere. Okay, so this, this is the nucleus accumbens, and this is really important in addiction. Okay, so the nucleus accumbens. Okay, often just abbreviated down to N for nucleus, and then capital A, lowercase c, like that for accumbens. So nucleus accumbens. Okay, so the nucleus accumbens receives a lot of input from monoaminergic systems, okay, particularly 
from dopamine secreting nerve cells. Okay, so part of the monoaminergic system uh, systems involves dopamine uh, clusters, which send projections all around the brain. Okay, so there are dopamine uh, secreting neurons clustered together, just like we've discussed. And the nucleus accumbens gets a huge number of projections from dopamine uh, secreting clusters of neurons. Okay, so the nucleus accumbens has a lot of projections coming into it which are bringing the neurotransmitter dopamine. Okay, so dopamine is very, very important in addiction. Now, what is the importance of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens? Well, what I'm firstly going to do is describe to you what we thought 10 years ago and then I'm going to de describe to you what we think now because it, the viewpoint has changed. Okay, so 10 years ago we thought that dopamine secretion into the nucleus accumbens by the monoaminergic systems determined how happy you were. It was important in pleasure. Okay, we thought that the reason that cocaine caused euphoria was that it raised dopamine in the nucleus accumbens and dopamine going up in the nucleus accumbens caused pleasure. Okay, specifically this was the idea of the nucleus accumbens being a reward center. Okay, so whenever something good happens to you dopamine would go up in the nucleus accumbens. That was the idea. Okay, and that's still true. When good things happen to you, uh, dopamine does go up in the nucleus accumbens. So, for instance, uh, orgasm produces uh, bursts of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. So, uh, upon orgasm, dopamine does go up in the nucleus accumbens. In addition, things like uh, quenching thirst uh, produces a rise in dopamine secretion in the nucleus accumbens. So when you have a drink, when you're really, really thirsty, that causes a rise in dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. So it does seem that good things cause dopamine to go up in the nucleus accumbens and cause pleasure. Okay, so that was the viewpoint 10 years ago. We thought that dopamine going up in the nucleus accumbens caused pleasure, cocaine caused the euphoria because it caused a massive rise in the amount of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens by blocking the reuptake of dopamine by the dopamine transporter. That is not the viewpoint that most people have anymore, however. Again, the reason is that we have found that dopamine also goes up in the nucleus accumbens in response to bad things. Okay, so when bad things happen to you, dopamine also goes up in the nucleus accumbens. So if you get punched in the face, dopamine will go up in the nucleus accumbens. And what we now think is that dopamine goes up in the nucleus accumbens in response to important things. And there is a nice word that psychologists love for important things. We call them salient things. Okay, so salient means important for survival. Okay, so salient stimuli are stimuli that are important for survival and which are therefore worth paying attention to. Okay, so now it seems that dopamine goes up in the nucleus accumbens when something important has happened. And things that are important are things which are either good or bad. So if something good happens to you, that is important, generally that will be good for your survival. If something bad happens to you, that is important to note for your survival as well. Okay, so dopamine seems to go up in the nucleus accumbens in response to important things. So why though? What's the point of dopamine going up in the nucleus accumbens in response to important things? Well, we think that it potentially is the switch on for learning. So we think dopamine is the signal to say, okay, turn on learning. Let's have some plasticity. We need to learn. Okay, so the idea is this, that when you are exposed to an important stimulus, a salient stimulus, something that you need to learn from, Okay, so either something good that you want to learn how to get it again, or something bad that you want to learn how to avoid, dopamine goes up in the nucleus accumbens, and the idea is that it turns on the ability to learn. It turns on the plasticity of the brain. It says, okay, we can now remodel the brain to try and either uh, promote us finding this good thing again, or avoid us finding this bad thing again. 
okay? So the idea now is that dopamine goes up in the nucleus accumbens to turn on plasticity of the brain, to turn on the ability to learn, okay? So the idea is that the ability to learn is turned on uh, when uh, something is deemed to be important by dopamine going up in the nucleus accumbens. Okay, so what's this got to do with addiction then? Well, the idea is then that cocaine causes dopamine to go up hugely in the nucleus accumbens, more than it would ever go up in response to a normal uh, good or bad stimulus. Okay, so the idea is then that you turn on the ability to learn the plasticity of the brain far too much. Okay, and what now happens is the brain is remodeled too much. Okay, and this is then what makes it so that the brain starts to believe that it cannot be well, it cannot survive without the drug, okay, why it then ends up becoming psychologically dependent on the drug, and why when you stop the drug, the brain then goes into this very, very ill state. Okay, uh, so I'll repeat that argument all over again. So our current viewpoint is that dopamine goes up in the nucleus accumbens in response to important stimuli, stimuli that should provoke learning, okay? And the idea is that it then somehow promotes um, the remodeling of the brain, it promotes plasticity of the brain so that you can learn from this important stimulus that has occurred, so you can learn how to get it again if it's good or to avoid it if it's bad. Okay, cocaine seems to totally hijack that system. It causes a massive rise of dopamine in this structure, the nucleus accumbens, on both sides, I should stress. So you have a left nucleus accumbens and a right nucleus accumbens. Dopamine will go up hugely in both of them uh, when you take cocaine, and it seems as though that turns on learning too much. Okay, so the brain is remodeled too much, and then the brain ends up becoming totally psychologically dependent on the drug, where it gets into a state where it thinks it cannot survive without the drug, and to the point where taking the drug uh, becomes almost a compulsion, and you will allow yourself to destroy your life just to continue taking the drug. Indeed, your entire life becomes devoted just to finding and taking the drug. Okay, so, as I say, we don't have a complete picture of this. This is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? We don't have an explanation as to why dopamine going up in the nucleus accumbens actually can turn on the plasticity of the brain. At the moment, it's just a hypothesis, okay? But it does seem as though potentially it has something in it. Okay, so I hope I have impressed on you how terrifying this drug actually is, and I hope uh, you will never ever take it. Uh, and with that, I will end this video on cocaine.